uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, um, children, young people, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you warmly to this exciting event to celebrate a major intellectual and advocacy piece of work, which in my view is a landmark on work on child rights here in Africa. We're here to celebrate the launching of the report by Plan International and African Child Policy Forum, Getting Girls Equal, the African Report on Girls and the Law. This is an important report for a variety of reasons. Law is fundamental and foundational for the respect and observance of human rights and the rights of children and obviously the rights of girls as well. What the law says or does not say, what the law does or does not do is of fundamental importance for the rights and well-being of all human beings and of course of girls in particular. And in this respect, it is important that we look at what the law says in Africa in respect of the rights and well-being of girls. This report is the first of its kind in that it reviews and analyzes and carries in one volume the kinds of laws and regulations that bear an impact on the rights and well-being of children, of girls in particular. It is a report that covers almost all aspects of the law and covers the laws and regulations and policies of all governments in Africa. So it is comprehensive, both in terms of content and geography. There is also another reason why we should celebrate this work. More often than not, almost universally, I would say, girls are treated in the child rights literature in a rather disparate and disjointed way. They are treated or viewed in terms of policy in the context, for example, of child marriage, forced marriage, trafficking, violence against girls, and so on and so forth, the most popular being FGM. But they have never been treated in a comprehensive way whereby we look at the whole gamut of laws as the impact on their rights and their well-being. And for this reason, you can say that this is the first comprehensive report that looks at the whole gamut of laws that impact on the African girl child. And in that respect, this is a pioneering report. We have been fortunate to have the partnership of one of the most important development organizations, child rights organizations in the world, Plan uh, International. Plan is a special partner of the African Child Policy Forum. We are in sync in terms of ethos, in terms of our values, and in terms of our priorities. And we have had a very long-standing relationship with Plan, and we are very, very proud of that. We are proud because we consider Plan International to be really one of the most progressive international development organizations, particularly in terms of its attitude about partnership between northern and southern organizations. And through you, Anne, uh, Bridget, Albrechtson, the CEO of Plan International, I would like to express our appreciation, our thanks, for the values that you uphold. And thank you very much for that. Now, this report would not have been possible at all 
without the support, the cooperation, and direct engagement of Plan International, there again, it would not have been possible without your support and Brigitte. Now, organizations are generally considered to have gotten their greatness, their strength, from inspired leadership. And no doubt, Plan International has benefited considerably and its lately acquired high profile is due to the inspiring and dynamic leadership of Anne Brigitte. But even so, we should also recognize that the greatness of organizations arises also from the commitment, from the imagination, the hard work of its staff. And in this respect, I'd like to pay special tribute to the director of Plan, uh, 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 the Pan-African office of Plan here in Addis Ababa, Sam Norga. <laughs> Sam, Sam was behind this whole idea. He was engaged throughout, and he mobilized all the necessary support to make this happen. I would say, and Brigitte, that you have in the person of Sam Norga, the ambassador par excellence. And I really would like to express our appreciation. I'm pleased to share with you also some good news. I had no doubt in my own mind that when we started this idea, when we started this project of coming up with a comprehensive report on the law and the girl in Africa, I had no doubt that it was going to be a path-breaking uh, work, and that was going to attract considerable attention. And I'm pleased to share with you the good news that's already inspiring considerable attention, media attention, and that's already opinion, uh, uh, you know, op-eds as we call them, which are essays on the editorial page of newspapers are appearing in major international newspapers and African regional newspapers. And that's also very good news for us. Now, coming to the program this afternoon, I'm pleased that we have a rather impressive uh, panel of, of, of speakers to uh, animate and enliven uh, the exchange of ideas and this conversation. You would have noticed that we have a rich and diverse representation of people from different organizations, Pan-African organizations, government institutions, international development partners, civil society organizations, and academia. I would like us to benefit from this opportunity. And for this reason, we are going to carry out this meeting in a rather unconventional way. We're going to have an informal, rather informal conversation. We're not going to have speeches. Rather, what I will try to do is to pose some specific questions which are of particular interest uh, to, uh, to particular individuals here on this panel. And we would like them to share with us their reaction to those questions, if possible, within a space of, of five minutes each so that we would have time for question and answer subsequent to those interventions. So that would be, if it is all right with you, the way I would like to go about it. So you are actually relieved from making speeches. You just make your short, powerful advocacy messages, the things that you want to say. Now let me introduce uh, our group of distinguished panelists. First, I'm Brigitte Albrechtson. Abe, as yes, she's called by her staff, is the chief executive officer of Plan uh, International. She was, prior to that, the deputy executive director of UNFPA and a number of, of different organizations. A jurist by training, she has had a long and distinguished career in international development. There are lots of things I can say about AB, but probably one will suffice. She has provided dynamic leadership and changed the orientation, the direction of 
the, uh, of Plan International in a manner that has made it really one of the most visible organizations on child rights, particularly on girls' rights. I have also with us here my colleague, Dr. Violet Odala. Violet, could you please? She's, she's there, but you'll be seeing her later. Violet is a lawyer, and she is the head of our Children and the Law program in the African Child Policy for, uh, program, and she's one of the pillars of our organization. Thank you very much, Violet. We were expected to have, we were expected to have uh, Aya uh, uh, Chebi, the AU Special Envoy on Youth, she has sent a message saying that she's been delayed by, by somebody. She should be joining us very soon. I'll introduce her when she comes here. Then we have Thais Woodstra, the deputy head of mission uh, and head of the develop, of development cooperation at the Netherlands embassy. The Dutch, I should tell you guys, have been my good luck for many, many years when I was in the ILO in Geneva and in Bangkok. Frankly, almost any new program that I started was supported by the Dutch. And therefore, I have a special affinity for your countrymen. And let me say that you represent one of the most progressive countries in the world in terms of development cooperation. And we therefore salute you and welcome you for being here with us. Thank you very much. We have also with us a Dr. Haragoy Van Tahun on behalf of the Minister of Science and Technology. Dr. Haragoy is, 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 is from academia originally. She has held several positions at the Addis Ababa University in the past as dean as well as the gender leader in Addis Ababa University. Her interest, her academic interest is in applied linguistics and communication. I'm so glad that you're here uh, with us, Dr. Haragoin. Actually, sometimes it is much better to have the advisor than the minister, because advisors are the usual brains behind policy, aren't they? And therefore, you are very much welcome here. There is my good friend, Professor, uh, <laughs> Professor Julia Slot Nilsson, a daughter of Africa. She is a scholar's scholar, a distinguished academic, the author of, I don't know, numerous, countless articles, papers, and publications. She is really one of the foremost academics in respect of child rights in general and child rights in Africa in, in, in particular. She is professor of uh, law, public law and jurisprudence at the University of uh, the Western Cape. And one of the things that people don't know about Julia, Julia we call her in this country, Professor Julia, that's how we call you in this country, Julia has been the mentor, the mentor and teacher of many of our distinguished jurists in Africa, in Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Western Africa. So you have your roots now, you have spread your roots throughout Africa, Julia, and that's no small thing. She is a longtime partner of the African Child Policy Forum. She has worked with us on a number of reports, including this one. And we really consider her not really as an outsider, but as one of us. And I'm so glad, Julia, that you could make it here with us. And then we have Dr. Daniel Bacana. Um, Daniel, of, who is the Chief Commissioner of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, of course, is well known amongst uh, Ethiopian human rights uh, advocates and campaigners, and he has paid a price for that. He was a prisoner of conscience for a number of years under the Mellis Denari regime, and subsequently after his release from prison, he pursued his doctoral studies at the University, University of Oxford, and he held 
senior positions in two of the world's most distinguished organizations, human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. It is really wonderful to have you back, Daniel, in your own home country. And there is so much that's expected of you. And it is an extraordinarily daunting and challenging task. We can only wish you good luck, uh, Dr. Daniel. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the, the one and only uh, Yatna Bersh. Um, I had, I, have, I think I have had, I can say I have a fantastic relationship with Yatna Bersh. So fantastic that sometimes I've, been, I've, I've even said some outrageous things. I remember once she was in my office with some colleagues. I don't remember if it was Bob Branson who was there on that occasion, and we were excitedly talking about a number of things, about traveling and so on, and yet never she started talking about her experience, her trip to Uganda. And she was saying, what a beautiful country, gorgeous landscape, the, 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 the livestock, the cattle, the sheep, and all that. And then I said, come on, Yetna Bash, you don't have eyes to see. On what basis do you say this? And then, without hesitation, without a moment, she says, you know, Dr. Asifa, yes, you have eyes. But I can smell, I can feel, and I can see. And that's what she did. <laughs> <laughs> and and Yetna Bash, of course, uh, is a woman of many faces, of many talents, and I would say of many eyes. Uh, she has been an outstanding campaigner for human rights, particularly the human rights of people with disability. She is a founding member, and she was also the executive director of the Ethiopian Center on, for, on Disability and Development. And right now, she is a senior inclusive advisor at Light, at Light uh, of the World. And as if that's not enough, she is now the deputy chair of the Ethiopian Peace uh, Commission. Yet, Nebesh, you are the best example of what we can all be, of what we can achieve with persistence and discipline. We are very proud of you. You make us proud. And we can only wish you well. And we're so glad that you are here with us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the panel of distinguished speakers that we have. And maybe you should give them another round of applause before I ask them to respond to the questions that I have prepared for them. Thank you very much. I have a, a few questions for, for our, 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 our panelists. Um, and I'll, I'll begin with, with the one person I'm most comfortable with, and that's you and Bridget. Um, you are the head and leader, or one of the three or four most, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. You are, as I said, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I was just uh, addressing my question to A.B. You are the leader and, and head of one of the most, of the most important 
development organizations working on children's issues. My first question to you, Anne Bridget, is how much of a difference do you think international development organizations like you have made in the lives, what kind of a difference do you think they have made in the lives of children here uh, in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. Button. Yes, here we go. Um, thanks a lot. And, and let me just um, thank you for uh, your kind welcome and, and words and your kind words to me. You know, Plan International in 2018 alone reached 32 million children across the world. Um, that's in programs in, in about uh, 55 countries. Um, here in Africa, we work in 26 countries. Um, and <laughs> measuring impact, as you know, is incredibly difficult. We can, measure, we, we can measure output. But we know that in every country where Plan International works, we work not only to ensure that girls and boys go to school, that they build leadership skills, work, skills for life, um, that they, they live a healthy life, that they're protected from violence, um, and that they, they start off their life well. We increasingly, and this is where I'm, I, I wanted to go, we increasingly work not just to change the individual child's life, but to actually change the conditions under which um, they can thrive. Um, and when it comes to the girl child, which has over the last 10 years become an increasing focus for the organization, we know that changing the life of the individual girl is good, but if we don't actually change the structures, the beliefs, the systems, the laws, um, in each country in which we work, with partners, with government, with, with anybody that cares for the same things we care, um, we won't actually be building a lasting impact. You know, so I love meeting the children, the, the girls and boys that we work with. We have lots of evidence that shows that girls that have been, but girls and boys that have been benefiting from, from plans programs uh, thrive, take on leadership, uh, roles, uh, become accomplished um, adults. Plan International has existed for 80 years. We're one of the few that can do longitudinal studies so we can follow the children into adulthood. So we can measure this. But as a, as a human rights activist, as a development professional, I will never be satisfied until I see the deep systemic change in each and every country that will allow for that deep sustainability. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was good. That was really good. You know, the, the, the point you made that uh, we should try to make a change not only in the lives of the individual child, but we should also try to look at the conditions that lead to child deprivation. And I think that is the most sustainable way of going about it. Okay, let me ask you another question. Now, as to the best of my knowledge, and historically, Plan International was something like a child sponsoring organization, a kind of fostering program. What in the world are you doing here now, writing reports or helping the preparation of reports? Yeah, we've come a, we've come a long way. Um, just just for those that those that might not know, just a teeny little bit about Plan International's history, um, and it's actually not that far away when you look at the essence. Plan International was started during the Spanish Civil War, um, on the the base premise that children that are going through war. Um, will always be left behind. They will always drop out of education. They will lose opportunities. And particularly, as we know today, the girl child will suffer even more than, than, than the boys. So in, in, we were founded in 1932. And at the heart of our essence, we still have 
this deep desire um, to make sure that we're impacting the most vulnerable children around the world. So while a, a, an organization that supports writing these types of reports is not the same as the one that was started in 1932, that is still at the core. The other thing that has impacted us a lot very recently, um, we, for the last, since the, uh, since the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which we also helped drive 30 years ago, um, we've seen many shifts in, in our programs. Um, when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted, we took a really hard look at ourselves, because the Sustainable Development Goals um, are a truly transformative agenda. And if every single one of us keeps doing exactly the same, even the good same that we're doing, it's not going to be enough. So every single organization, institution, donor, government, etc., will need to do something different. And we looked at ourselves and we said, what's the best thing we can do? So we, we set upon, we, we said we don't want to be a child rights organization amongst the many other child rights organizations. We want to be the organization and today the only organization that works squarely in the intersection between the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention um, on Eliminating All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So, so we are today the world's largest girls' rights organization because, as you will see from the report, as well as many other reports, the girl child is the one that always gets left behind. Thank you, thank you very much. But do reports matter at all? Well, the report, this report will not matter at all if it stays on the shelf. The only way to make it matter is to break it down into individual action um, in every single country that is uh, that has been reviewed by this, by this report, and that is across the African continent. So we, this, this launch today is you know, just one of many, many, many steps that we will be pursuing uh, with this report. We will be obviously taking it to the AU, discussing it with member states there, to embassies um, here in Addis, but also to every single country, with country briefs for each country, looking at the individual policies that uh, are discriminatory, working with governments, working with activists, working with children themselves to make sure that the policies um, are changed in all the countries where we have an ability to effect an impact. Thank you very much. I think she deserves an applause, don't you think? Yes. Let me go to my Dutch friend, the Dutch Deputy Ambassador. I, I told you that the Dutch are my good luck almost. Every project that I under to this, they financed it. So I'm glad you're here. Now tell me, um, you belong to one of those countries that, is, uh, that has been really path-breaking in terms of gender equality, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say so? Uh, but could you sort of share with us what the European experience has been in terms of where you were and where you are now and where we might be in the future? Thank you, Dr. Professor of Asefa. Um, I feel... Asefa. yes, correct? Professor of Asefa. Thank you very much for giving me the floor, Professor. And thank you for inviting me to this panel, which I'm honored to be in. The Dutch, as promoters of equal rights, um, it has not been always the case. In 60 years ago, the situation was quite different. But uh, through societal change, and uh, through also uh, action of women themselves, uh, society has changed to a more egalitarian society where women and men enjoy equal rights has changed. It was a path that has taken as well, starting from women's voting rights in the beginning of the 19th century, no, 20th century, until now, where we are still not having a female prime minister, but at least we do have seen a lot of progress in women and women's rights. To talk about girls' rights, I guess it started first with education. 
and curriculum development at schools, access to education, access uh, to all parts of education and also the curriculum which also teaches children equality between men and women is key for, uh, for, uh, for in the society where women, men and women are equal. We've gone through a long period of changing our education system, but things have been in place. Another part which I can say that is well, a prime example, and I guess it's in Netherlands in 2011, we started a youth ombudsman, especially uh, a person delegated for rights of children everywhere in the country. If rules and regulations or behavior of governments, of private institutes, affects children's rights, they can go to the ombudsman and he can start to investigate and amend rules and regulations. A very important institute, and I would like that other countries should also follow that example. It is followed in some European countries, but not in all. It is very much an institute which also creates advocacy for children's rights in its own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one other question to you. One other question to you. Do girls matter in your international development cooperation policy? Well, sitting here, <laughs> at least girls do matter uh, in our foreign policy. They matter in our uh, development policy. They matter in our SRHR program. We do have in Ethiopia and in other African countries, we do have projects aimed at menstrual hygiene at schools, aimed at safe spaces at schools for girls. So girls can go to school and don't have to be outside of the school one week each month or even earlier, we are projects ending child marriage. We are supporting, big supporter of PLAN, to be frank. And also advocacy, child rights, and especially girls' rights is at the heart of our policy. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Now, we, we come to you um, with the, Dr. Haragoy. Um, is, is, is gender inequality a problem in this country? And, and, uh, and is it the government's fault or whose fault is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, African uh, Child Policy Forum for inviting the uh, Minister of Science and Higher Education. And it's really an honor to be here to represent Her Excellency Professor Hirut Oldamareb. She's abroad, but uh, just joining you in this remarkable uh, report launching. Uh, it matters a lot to, to higher education, uh, too. Having said this, gender inequality, uh, not only a problem, but a very serious problem for this country. In fact, uh, we have ratified almost all gender-related policies. We have developed and improved our policy framework uh, just to promote gender uh, equalities in the country. But, uh, you know, the status of women and girls in Ethiopia is really uh, curtailed when you look at empowerment, education, and when you look at gender-based uh, violence and uh, uh, employment opportunity. I think it's good to look at some important figures related to uh, education. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, one in every child uh, get the chance to enroll to uh, the uh, secondary education. At the primary level, uh, I think we are successful. But when it comes to the secondary education, uh, I think uh, most of our girl students uh, drop out of the schools for a number of reasons. And again, um, from these, only 10% of secondary school aged uh, students or girls, female uh, students, enroll in colleges and universities. And this is uh, from Education Abstract uh, Annual 2018, a recent figure, not uh, too far. Again, if you look at uh, the share of female prospective graduates, 
uh, in the previous year, uh, we can find only 38%. And it's not only for the girl students. The disparity uh, is also reflected with the female academics. We'll find only 80% of the academic staff are females. So it's very clear, it's not only this, related to gender violence, the problem uh, not only increasing, but it has become very severe from time to time. And this time, we can see about 49% of Ethiopian women have been experiencing physical violence. And again, 59% of Ethiopian women have suffered from sexual violence. So it's really very frustrating. Even though we are taking a number of initiatives, still, still we have uh, this uh, problem. Related to opportunity for employment, again, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, when women are employed, obviously, uh, to uh, hold job externally with poor pay, and 40% of Ethiopian women are, uh, I think, employed uh, with low paying service sector, you know. So uh, obviously the problem is very uh, significant. Whose who's responsible is it? I think gender inequality is a socio-cultural as well as political problem both the society as well as the government are responsible for this. But in my view, the government should take the lion's share and the government should be more responsible for that. And simply ratifying the conventions, uh, developing and reviewing the policies might not be sufficient. We need to look more other ways of tackling the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another okay. question for you. I have another question for you. you, you you're quite right. I think the, stati the statistics in terms of, uh, uh, of, of gender uh, in secondary school education and university school yeah. is, is, a, is, a, is embarrassing, quite, mm. quite frankly. It's, mm. it's sad. But, but I have another question, and that is that... Well, the quality of education is very poor in any case. Yeah. So what does it really matter whether one goes to high school or university or not? Oh, well, when you talk about the quality of education, uh, obviously it's connected with uh, lots of variables. And uh, one and, uh, most important thing is that having very quality curriculum is very much important, the education system and the quality teachers should be there, and the infrastructure should be, you know, we do have very beautiful uh, policies related to education. You could look at the sector development programs. They are very much interesting. When we come to the implementation, we do have lots of problems, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we cannot think about quality education without quality teacher. And quality chairs cannot be, you know, found without very supporting working environment, incentives, and the likes. Uh, so they are interrelated uh, problems, I think. But let, let me ask you one final question, yeah. and I wouldn't bother you. Let's admit it, Dr. Haragoy, education is a, has become political in this country. Obviously. What the government is interested in is ensuring that we have fantastic st statistical achievements, fantastic enrollment mm -hmm. at every level. So many universities, let's say from the days of Haile Selassie where you had only one or two universities, now we have 100 universities. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are you really serious? Yeah, we have about eight universities in 2004. Now we have got uh, 50 public universities. You're right. We have got a very significant expansion in the number of universities. But still, 
we do have a problem with the quality of education offered in these universities. Uh, obviously, the government should work on it. Uh, how? It begins with the review of the curriculum and uh, the Ministry of Science and Higher Education uh, has got only about 10 months uh, it is established, uh, separated from Ministry of Education last year. And now we are working on a number of reforms. Among these reforms, thinking about the quality of education, we are trying to differentiate the universities in the area of specialization. Uh, so not only differentiating and uh, reviewing the programs themselves, because unless we are uh, able to produce competent graduates, it has no any advantage just to have a number of graduates every year, so it doesn't make any sense to the development of the country. So we are working on that. And one of the aspects is that, just considering the gender perspective in higher education. Thank yeah. you very much. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Professor Julia Sloth Nelson. Julia, now you, you don't want to treat us like your students, okay? In other words, you should speak to us in a very plain language. No academic jargon. Tell me, Julia, what do you think are the most the most important challenges we should address? in terms of legal reform and access to justice for girls in Africa? Thank you. I, I think, as is probably well known, there's been some progress in drafting gender-neutral children's laws, laws relating to gender-based violence, uh, improved trafficking uh, legislation, some places have got revised family law codes which are more gender neutral. But clearly there needs to be a complete audit. And secondly, the laws need to be implemented. Um, they need to be implemented not only in the capital city, they need to be implemented in the regions, in the counties, in the provinces, um, and in the deep rural areas too. Where laws provide for implementing provisions, which in academia we call regulations, to say exactly how things must happen, who must respond, by when, we find that oftentimes the children's law is developed and the regulations are not there. They remain to be written. Right. So the law is not going to be effective because it's not clear who must do what. And then when the law set up specialized services and uh, structures and institutions to um, respond to allegations of, for instance, violence, there has been some progress. We have, in many countries, specialized family and child units in the police. We have some specialized uh, units responding to uh, reports of sexual violence, taking the necessary uh, medical uh, information and so forth. But again, it's not everywhere, it's not sustained. They are often vulnerable to funding cuts, they're vulnerable to changes in policies, and so we, we make very halting progress. Wow, but you have opened a Pandora's box, haven't you? The moment you talk about implementation and enforcement, that's a huge, huge challenge almost throughout Africa, isn't it? It is. It, it's got a number of facets to, to it, as you at the African Child Policy Forum know very well, because of the reports that you have produced in the past on African child well-being, where you've been looking at this. And it depends on uh, political will. It depends on uh, consistency in policies, not just flip-flopping from this thing to the next between different governments and different regimes. It depends on training and more training and more training mm. and on sustaining the capacity 
of the sectors, whether it's education, whether it's medical, whether it's uh, law enforcement, sustaining their capacity to carry the project forward. I was interested in my, my colleague's mention of 60 years. Um, it seems from where I sit, I've been working in this field for 30 years, it seems that we might need a bit more than 60 years to make the kind of sustained progress that you can actually talk um, about a whole country um, instead of just a project or a few instances um, of specialization. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, <laughs> Ju Julia has an encyclopedic knowledge of the law, but uh, but time is short, so we'd, we'd skip for the moment. We may have to come back uh, again. Now, my friend Daniel Bakala, for uh, your director of the Africa program of Ch Human Rights Watch, then you worked for, for Amnesty, so you know the human rights landscape uh, in Africa as well as anybody else could possibly do. What do you think? Why is that? We're some 60, 70 years after colonialism and after the arrival of the political kingdom. Why is it that we are where we are in terms of human rights? Uh, th thank you, Asafa. And uh, let me first congratulate uh, both uh, ACPF and Plan International on the launch of your report. And I'm, I'm also pleased to note that there is a specific case study on Ethiopia. Uh, and I look forward to working with uh, both plan and uh, ACPF, as, as Anne Bridge uh, was saying, to break it down into actionable points and uh, work, uh, work towards uh, the reform of uh, relevant laws and policies in Ethiopia. Uh, and coming to your question, uh, the human rights challenge in Africa is uh, pretty complicated uh, and compounded by a lot of uh, social, political, and economic factors. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, while we do recognize the, the impact of the social and economic factors uh, contributing to the uh, human rights uh, crisis in Africa, I think largely the human rights crisis in Africa is, uh, is a product of the political crisis in Africa. Uh, Africa has not been able to uh, fix its political uh, problems, uh, particularly the, the internal uh, governance systems and uh, the resolution of internal political issues and the governance issues has been a subject of controversy uh, for many, many years, uh, uh, despite coming out of the colonial time, as you uh, noted, Asafa. Uh, so I guess, you know, the, the, the failure to resolve the, the political issues and the political disputes uh, has led into violent conflicts and the violent conflicts uh, in the context in which perhaps the most severe human rights abuses happen in a context of violent conflict uh, from, from large number of killings to huge number of displacement uh, um, to uh, uh, you know the, the political uh, uh, crisis led abuses and violations in a country are largely a product of the, the political crisis in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, but I have one other uh, question for you. It may be a bit too sensitive for you, Dr. Daniel, but I think it has to be asked. Okay, you have this wealth. You are a prisoner yourself. You had this wealth of experience at uh, Human Rights Watch uh, and Amnesty. Now you come to this country where everything is topsy-turvy. Um, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, let me put it generously. It's a very challenging political uh, environment where you have this seeming conflict or tension, perhaps, between the demands of the rule of law, which probably would mean the exercise of authority on one side, 
on the other hand, to take the risks associated with a, with a very open and soft approach. How do you think we can maneuver through this kind of crisis, this challenge, to ensure that we have the observance, no, the promotion of human rights and the observance of human rights in a challenging political environment? How do you see yourself maneuvering through? Is that a fair question? Uh, uh, yeah, fair point to raise, and uh, not there is not necessarily uh, an easy answer to it. As, as as I said, you know, the human rights challenge in uh, in Africa and in our own Ethiopia is uh, is a deep rooted one and a complicated one, and it really requires a long term perspective and a long term uh, vision. Uh, we just need to make sure that we persist uh, on the human rights cause, we persist on the human rights agenda, uh, and we persist on the human rights work uh, if we are to make a change over a long term. But I think we should have uh, uh, you know, an expectation that many of these deep-rooted uh, human rights problems uh, are, uh, are going to go away in a short time frame. So it really requires uh, a long-term work. But it does seem to me that, you know, among a number of other things, it's very important uh, to focus on uh, perhaps one, uh, on a massive human rights education program in a country like Ethiopia, where uh, we see problems around, uh, you know, lack of respect for human dignity. Uh, and for a lot of Ethiopians and, uh, and Ethiopian observers, uh, perhaps the uh, most recent incidents in Ethiopia seems to be very uh, shocking, uh, the, the extent of the brutality we have seen in some of the human rights crises. So it, um, it makes you think whether or not uh, we have proper uh, social fabrics uh, for acknowledging and recognizing human dignity, which is at the heart of uh, what human rights all mean. So, you know, we need a culture of human rights, which means uh, uh, a huge program of awareness and campaign and, uh, and education. Uh, and then I think it's also equally important that we press on accountability. Uh, we don't seem to take accountability very seriously in, uh, in Africa and in Ethiopia as well. Uh, and, and that lack of accountability seems to continue a culture of abuse and a culture of impunity uh, in the country. So I think we need to press uh, strongly on holding perpetrators to account. Uh, and we, um, you know, sometimes when we seem to be taking measures in, in the name of accountability, uh, we seem to be going after the small fish and we let the big fish to continue to swim uh, freely in a culture of impunity. So it's very important that there has got to be a strategic approach to pressing on questions of uh, accountability. And perhaps the third point is the importance of building institutions. You know, in countries uh, where there is a better protection of uh, uh, human rights, it's because they have institutions to enforce and protect rights. Uh, and, and I hope, you know, in, uh, in Ethiopia, what we need to be doing uh, is building those kind of institutions that would be the vanguards of uh, uh, human rights protection. Thank you very much. That was good, wasn't it? That was good, blunt talk. I like that myself. One final question to you. We're talking about girls. My question to you is, do girls deserve a special attention in your human rights work or not? Oh, absolutely. So what are you yeah. planning to do about it? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, I mean, one of probably the top human rights issues in, in Ethiopia is women's rights and uh, child rights issues, which includes uh, girls' rights. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, in addressing uh, a lot of uh, uh, systemic, structural causes uh, of uh, abuses on girls and children in general. Uh, and I, I'd be very keen, as I mentioned, to, to, to look at your findings and recommendations. Uh, but from uh, my perspective, you know, there's no question that women's rights and child rights issues uh, will continue to be one of the big priorities. And if I would 
think of one, uh, one issue that we probably need to be prioritizing when it comes to African girls, Ethiopian girls, or probably a bit more broadly on, uh, uh, on, on African children and Ethiopian children is the need to end child hunger which seems to be uh, a persistent problem, uh, but is also a massive shame for all of us that we, uh, we continue to let our children to starve. So I think, you know, if, if we would prioritize, I would really urge that we find a way to, to end child hunger. And that seems to me is within our means and, uh, and there should be a way to do this in a sustainable way without necessarily relying on a non-sustainable external support. And if I may, Asafa, uh, allow me to, to suggest one idea which I think like we should be doing in, maybe in Ethiopia, uh, but not only in Ethiopia, but, uh, but maybe across Africa as well, uh, as a way of finding a solution to something uh, like you know the, the, the uh, some of the issues that your own center has been working on about uh, a school feeding program you know mm -hmm. if we needed to respond a way of ending child hunger one example of it seems to me is really implementing a genuine dedicated committed uh, school feeding program and the way i think about it a school feeding program is in our means if we simply take uh, the lottery money in Africa, uh, the lottery money seems to me is, is a money should, that should not belong in the coffers of government. The lottery money in Africa can definitely sustain and uh, uh, feed uh, children in school. So, I mean, if we can do something like uh, an Africa-wide advocacy campaign, to take lottery money from government, to use it for, uh, to, to, to finance a school feeding program. And if we can start that campaign from Ethiopia and we can take lottery money, to, uh, you know, like if we use it for such a social cause, I see a potential we can double it and triple it and can be a sustainable source to, uh, to fund uh, kids going to school who should not be hungry. So I think, you know, that I would really like to take that as an advocacy challenge for groups working on this issue, uh, that maybe it can also be a continent-wide advocacy campaign. Lottery Latamari. Wow. Wow, we do have a man of substance here, don't we? I think he deserves an applause again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniel Bakala. My good friend, Yetna Bush. Um, I, 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 I need hardly say that uh, you, are, uh, you are someone uh, uh, who, who, is, uh, who is the perfect example of man or woman prevailing on circumstances in many, many ways. You come from an exceptionally impressive and challenged background. Would you be able to tell us what it means to be a woman in Ethiopia? <laughs> Thank you. And I think that's not an easy question, right? So. I would also like to start by congratulating Boz Plan and uh, ACPF for this amazing report, which I am proud to say that it also contains elements on inclusion. So I'm so proud to say that both ACPF and Plan do share the inclusive channel, the inclusive path. So I think it's a perfect marriage of partnership. Uh, to be uh, fair to this question, I think to be a woman in Ethiopia would have different faces because Ethiopian women are quite different, resilient, and uh, challenged in a number of ways. And I love the topic getting girls equal because being, girl, being a girl is something that I have been once upon a time 
and I wish if I can be again. And it's something that my, the majority of my house is. I've got three girls who uh, at one point will be 10 women. So getting girls equal is so sounding. So being a woman in Ethiopia would give you a number of opportunities and challenges. However, it's also important to understand that there is a huge point of intersectionality in being a woman in Ethiopia. Ethiopian women are rural women. Ethiopian women are pastoralist women. Ethiopian women are saving women. Ethiopian women are internally displaced women, especially at this point in time. So being Ethiopian women is, of course, an opportunity, and in the meantime, a challenge. But something very important I want to highlight is the fact that there are a number of intersectionality between being a woman, being a poor woman, being a woman or a girl with a disability, being a girl or a woman with, with HIV AIDS, or whatever sorts of layer we put it, the intersectionality is something very vibrant that we cannot avoid to continue ignoring. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Yetna Bush, basically what you're saying is that we should look at women in, in context. We have to look at the context within which they exist. But let me ask you one other question. Um, you, are, you have thought about many of these, uh, many of these issues uh, in various capacities. You know, you were the executive director of the Ethiopian Center on Disability and Development. Uh, you have been working in international NGOs. Uh, uh, now you are working with the Peace Commission. But let's, let me just give you this opportunity that you have a magic wand. If you had that magic wand, what would be the one or two things that you will do to change the conditions of girls in Ethiopia? <sighs> I think what I have noticed, especially growing and coming into different assignments, even though voluntarily, is that it's always difficult to exercise power, right? Especially uh, recently. So the magic wound that I would uh, do to change the condition of girls in Ethiopia is definitely going to be very difficult because Ethiopian girls do face multiple problems still. And I was witnessing just last week a girl was raped and killed here in Addis, around Yeka Mikael area. And we're all quiet about it. And I happen to be also in South Africa when that girl who was raped and killed by the post office, just behind the post office, by the post office guy, all the women were out. So I feel like my Ethiopia is a country that you're not allowed even to cry while somebody pinches you. So I feel heavy hurt about the silence that we are entertaining in this country when it comes into girls' issue. And of course, most of you know about the host, Ethiopian Airlines hostess, who had entertained the same, who, have, who passed away the same way, being raped and killed here in Addis, not anywhere else. So like in South Africa, women were really, really vibrant they were vocal. It was during the World Economic Forum um, in Cape Town, Julia's town also. And uh, women were out. They didn't seek any permission to cry. But we, I, I talked to some women activists and lead women organizations because it's difficult to lead those kind of activisms when you are a reconciliation commissioner. So I asked, I asked them and then they told me, well, we had to ask permission and uh, the government is not happy that we can do this kind of things. So um, I would think the fact that we are very quiet about things and we are very submissive about things is that we don't have the right equipment. We are not equipped enough to say no 
two things that we said no for. So I would give the no 101, which is education, quality, and inclusive education. Thank you. <laughs> Now we're coming to the almost the end of our of our um, uh, of our uh, event. Um, I like to sort of give the panelists. Uh, uh, I'd like to give the just to say the last word, if, uh, if, if I may. Um, I, I, I like. I think this time I'd like to start with the other question, then I'll end up with uh, Andrzej. So the other question. What should the next theme of children advoc child rights advocacy should be? I think for me, I would say keep your promise. I think we're so tired of new promises. We really want to get stuck to the old promises and we really want to see them done. I want to come back to Wesson's reflection on the relevance of, of education. I do feel that um, it's not about simply educating, but it's about what we are educating. Because in the past decades here in Ethiopia, I was talking with my cousin wh who lives in another region, and what she has learned completely is different from what, what I have learned. So the what matters. On the last piece of investing in education, ambassador, the Seashells, the Paradise Ambassador. I just really feel the same and I would invite you to see the research that my organization, Light for the World, has done investing in education. And that's true, they don't want to invest in education. I, don't, I didn't do any research, but our research shows that it's, especially for inclusive education, investment is quite, quite, quite low in Africa. I would assume that part of the reason is that like children with disabilities, in particular girls with disabilities, are presumed to be less worthy teaching. However, I do feel I have a gut feeling that most of our leaders who are in power today did not come through the path of education. They have come through the path of guns. So somebody pays more for something that he or she has exercised or witnessed, tasted. So had they tasted education, I think they would know the price. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Daniel, please. Uh, thank you. On, on the point about the importance of human rights education, I could not agree more, uh, including on the point of integrating human rights education into the uh, mainstream education system. But at the same time, I also like to see us find a new and innovative ways of doing human rights education. So I would, I would really encourage if anyone has any thoughts about how better and how effectively we can do human rights education in Ethiopia, please, please do come to the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, you know, not only on this idea, but on a number of other issues. Uh, if there are some thoughts on uh, how we could do better on a lot of issues, uh, please do come to the commission and I look forward to working with, uh, with, with anyone interested to work on these issues. I think I felt the same way on the issue on Gazain's point about a team. I felt the same way like, you know, I, I, Gazain, I see your point about the importance of having a team to galvanize our work, uh, but I also get concerned about jumping from one team to another team before we achieve uh, what we set out to achieve with the various teams. And I wish uh, this is also a way of focusing at uh, the, the, the goals uh, achieved in the teams. And, and in my view, like I said, you know, uh, I wish uh, we achieve uh, the, the goal of ending child hunger, and I wish we achieve, we find a way of uh, uh, sustainably funding a school feeding program before we move to other teams. Uh, and it, we have a, a, a Dutch friend here. In Netherlands, they have this uh, lottery program called the Postcode Lottery which is a very fascinating uh, uh, way of lottery system. And they, they raise tons of money every year. And, and the Dutch use that money they raise from the lottery to fund projects in Africa, Asia, all over the world, you know. They, they fund development projects with the lottery money they raised in, in Netherlands. And we have the postcode lottery money in other places. But the one in Dutch is also one of the big ones. And it just breaks my heart that the Europeans use the lottery money to fund projects in our countries 
And we have African governments that use gambling to raise money and feed government coffers. So if you really want a team, I want us to work on a team of like lottery money for like for school feeding, for for such a social cause, you know. And this this is this is a money we have to take from government to use for social causes as opposed to uh, being. Uh, being a money that should go into government <laughs> coffers. So if, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, if anyone is interested on working this issue and joining me, Hans, I really want to speak with you uh, because I think this is something within our means and we should be able to achieve it uh, b before we even be begin to move to other uh, teams. There was something else I wanted to say, but it scared my mind as a fast, so I'll pass it to you. It's okay. Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Julia. I think what I learned out of working on this project was that even when the law uh, looks as if it's sort of equal, that there are people who drop off and that girls are particularly affected. And it's not something that happens when they are very young necessarily, but as we get to the indicators at the end of their childhood at 18, we can see the disparity has grown and grown and grown. And we did follow the idea or the approach of intersectionality, um, of looking at who is likely to be left behind. That was raised by Yetna Bush. Um, I want to turn to the uh, intervention by the ambassador for the Seychelles who talked about education and empowerment. And I want to mention something else which nobody has talked about today, and that is patriarchy. I don't want to talk about custom and tradition. We find patriarchy everywhere. We find it in the leafy suburbs, in the wealthy suburbs of Johannesburg and Cape Town and Nairobi, as much as we find it in the rural areas and in the villages. So along with empowerment of girls, we have to tackle patriarchy because that is what results in girls dropping out of school, in girls being denied access to sexual and reproductive health services, which ultimately limits their life chances because they get married too young, they have children too young, they die too young. So we have to uh, tackle the flip side of the coin of empowerment, which is patriarchy. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, uh, I think we must uh, walk the, uh, you know, the talk. We're talking a lot. And uh, this is not the time to talk about our policy framework is because we have said a lot. And I, I believe that we have done a lot in that area. What is left is that just putting it into practice. So we have to, everything, every possible way is pointing to education. And especially we in the education sector uh, should take, you know, the point into great consideration. And the first thing, uh, we need to incorporate gender equality in our curricula, starting from the lower grade to the higher education and institutions. And again, we have to work to create safe and comfortable, suitable environment, education environment for the girls, for the children, if we want to have a real, you know, uh, gender equality in this sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Um, before going to this uh, panel, I asked to some woman what I should say and what should be done on the situation in Ethiopia. And one of the answers was also educate the men that harass the women and discriminate against women. And I agree completely with Professor Julia at saying patriarchism, but also the man. And in this room, we see some girls. And I hope in future we also see boys at this kind of panels, because I guess it's not a girl's problem. It's a problem of boys and girls together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. 
Thank you very much, um, Asefa. And, and since I do have the, the, the final word, let me just say the things that I, I do want to say um, also publicly in terms of thanks to ACPF, USF personally, to Violet and the work that you and your team have done to the government of Netherlands for, uh, for funding this, um, this work. Um, you know, the, the question around, and it also goes to the question asked by, by, by the young girl, um, what should really be our next campaign? We have come to the conclusion at Plan International that despite all the good work, despite the good laws, despite you know, progress in girls' education, um, despite better health services, despite many, many good things, we are not moving the needle on rights uh, fast enough. And at the heart of it was exactly what was mentioned further down the road, both patriarchy as well as the harmful norms um, and, and practices. So the only campaign that matters for us right now is to make sure that in every corner, not just of Africa, but all over the world, um, the girl child is equally seen, heard, and valued from birth, in her family, in school, in communities, in the workplace, everywhere. Because there is no place in the world, actually, not even in my own home country, Denmark, that often ranks very high on lists where there is true gender equality. This is not an African problem. But when we do look at the statistics in Africa, there are some considerable challenges. And when a girl child is not valued, seen, and heard, when she is not given the choice to consent or not to consent, but her body is violated on a daily basis, when she doesn't even have the basic information to how to say no, how to navigate power, how to protect herself, um, how to get access to services, and those services are barred to her because her body and her actions are being criminalized, then we have a problem. Um, and that, for me, is, is at the end of the day, if, we, if, if a girl's no is not a no, then, then we can argue from now to kingdom come about all the things we argued about in Nairobi or other things or in other meetings of the AU, etc. And we won't actually be fulfilling what Africa itself has said it values, which is an Africa whose development is people-driven, that also means girl-driven, relying on the potential offered by people, especially its women, youth, and children. That is what Africa itself has said that it values. And so let's make sure that at every time, yes, we should fix these discriminatory laws that this report says, and yes, we should drive their implementation. But the only way to get real traction is to put the girl's child at the center. And I want to therefore also finish with sort of a formal sort of launch and explanation also of the title, Getting Girls Equal. Because also Plan International's global campaign, Girls Get Equal, is all about making sure that every girl um, is equally seen, heard, and value, because that is the heart of everything that is missing in terms of gender equality on all continents. Thank you, Asefa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avery. That's, that's, that is uh, that's a, a fantastic conclusion to a very interesting. Uh, Sam, can you please come? Sam Noga, please. It's now your turn. Uh, to do what you need to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Sefa. Um, I mean, normally on a Friday evening, um, around this time, we probably would not be sitting here for three hours. We probably would be sitting um, either home, um, with our friends, maybe with um, a glass, but despite all of, and I can see people nodding, so I'm actually telling the truth. 
Um, so, Excellencies, distinguished panelists, our friends, um, I can see many of them here. I would like to say a big thank you. Um, we called you, you acknowledge, and you said you would come, and you actually did come. So thank you very much for sitting through and for making sure that you are part of this historic event. I think a lot has been said, and um, almost everything that is said here is what needs to be done. But somebody needs to do it. And the question is, who is going to do it? I think it will take all of us, probably not doing the ordinary, because the ordinary hasn't helped us. Maybe what we need to do is the extraordinary. And the extraordinary can be done by the extraordinary people who defiled a Friday afternoon, the traffic, everything else, to be here. And so this is my challenge, um, and as I thank all of you, and as I call AB to launch the report officially. Yeah, I've already done that. You've done? Yeah. Let, let them, let them, let okay, them go. <laughs> there it is. Okay. It's to say, uh, we have Agenda 2063, we have 2040, we have CLC, it's 30 years, probably older than all the young ladies over there. We have the African Charter, which is going to be 30 years next year. The question is, what are we doing to make sure that the world, this planet we live on, is safe, not just safe, safer, not just safer, but probably the safest place for our girls to be able to sit, to be able to relax, to be able to talk about the things they want to talk about. They are our girls, they are our daughters, they are our sisters, they are our nieces, our mothers, they get violated every day. And I would want to challenge each one of us to go back, read the report, and then tell yourself what you think you want to do to make the world a safer place for our girls. Thank you very much for coming. And Abby, I have the pleasure of inviting you to, to, what? to launch. You launch it. You do it. Okay, I've been asked to uh, launch the report. The report is launched. So <laughs> and now we invite the participants. You go do that.
There is really somebody uh, who has been quiet uh, and whose voice we should, we should hear, uh, and that is uh, Dr. Violet uh, Ordala, who led, coordinated this whole uh, operation and is the principal author of, uh, of this uh, report. Now, Violet, um, uh, in, a, in a way, I have been un I'm unfair to you because I give the others the opportunity, but then as the host organization, we should be uh, respectful and polite, and that's why we wanted to give our, our friends uh, a lot more time than, than we would otherwise. Um, but would you like to share with us, uh, having heard uh, the various interventions here, and having worked on the report, could you sort of share with us very succinctly, if, 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 if you may, uh, uh, your, your observations and your thoughts on girls and the law in Africa? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sefa, and uh, uh, thank you, our distinguished panelists, and all those people who have uh, asked questions uh, this afternoon. Uh, indeed, uh, this is a report that uh, we have done in collaboration with PLAN, looking seriously at uh, uh, the law and how it, tre it treats girls in Africa. And um, um, the questions uh, that have uh, been asked, uh, most of the responses uh, you can find in the, in the report, but I would like to highlight a few things that uh, stand out as uh, key challenges that uh, we're still facing in Africa when it comes to girls and uh, the law. And uh, I will respond uh, in a visual way uh, by putting up a few slides up here so that uh, we can appreciate uh, the nature of uh, the challenges. I promise I will not take up much of your time. And uh, the, the first thing I want to say is that uh, we are 30 years uh, since in the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and next year it will be 30 years since we adopted the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. And indeed it has been raised here that uh, uh, we have very good laws that have been uh, developed, policies that have been developed. Yes, we can say yes to that, but the challenge is when you look at the laws in general, or on the face of it, they look like they have no discriminatory impact. But when you begin to analyze and uh, uh, look deeply into how those laws affect every child as an individual, that means a girl as a girl, a boy as a boy, but even when you're looking at girls, a girl, is it a girl with disability, or is it a, 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 a what, um, um, our sister, yet never reflected on here that there are multiple uh, 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 intersex intersectionalities, multiple levels of intersectionalities on the issues that affect girls. So even when we are talking about girls, it's not just looking at the girl as uh, on the face of it, but uh, the particular vulnerabilities that that kind of girl faces. So the first thing is uh, we have discriminatory laws. The laws are there, yes. They may be uh, gender neutral on the face of it, but uh, discriminatory uh, when you begin to uh, uh, look at their impact uh, on, uh, on various uh, uh, groups of girls or children, rather. And then um, the issue of, uh, 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 or rather, let me give examples of uh, how the law discriminates against girls. If you look at access to education, the issue of education, we've talked about it a lot this afternoon. We have indeed so many countries, almost 47 in Africa, which have adopted uh, free and compulsory education policies. And uh, you can, every country can you know, stand tall and say, you know, we have good policies on education. But now begin to look at the, what that policy means for the girl child. Uh, what, what does a girl child need to actually say that this education is free and is compulsory and also inclusive for me? There are different needs for boys and girls. So that's where we talk of, for example, 
school retention policies? How is the law ensuring that girls are being retained in schools? And when a girl falls pregnant, is the law providing for mechanisms for making sure that that girl really goes back to school and retains? And that's where now we have the challenge in Africa, that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, good uh, uh, laws that uh, seem gender neutral on the face of it, but uh, in practice and, but, uh, and when broken down to the individual girl, they are gender discriminatory. And uh, we have also, for example, if we look at um, laws uh, dealing with uh, children with disabilities, girls with disabilities, Africa, especially common, uh, 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 in the uh, Commonwealth, most African countries adopted or received the uh, English law it was handed down to them 50, 60 years ago, and uh, they adopted the laws and the provisions the way the English legal system uh, uh, handed down the laws to them. And some of the things that were uh, first adopted, for example, we have provisions that say uh, 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 defilement of an idiot or an imbecile girl. You know, uh, to this date, you know, we have such degrading uh, kinds of languages in the law. And uh, 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 laws have been change, changing, uh, there have been uh, uh, revisions of laws uh, over the years, but no one is looking at uh, what, the, what the particular laws in some countries are saying about a, a, a girl with disabilities who gets defiled. Or how is the law addressing, addressing that, 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 that girl? That's another example. And then, apart from dis the discriminatory nature of the laws, we have um, inadequacy, laws that are inadequate. That's the second thing. And in this, uh, we have, um, for example, penalties that not, do not match the gravity of the offense. You have laws, especially dealing with uh, uh, sexual violence of girls, if you look at the issue of abduction, what kind of penalties are, are being given in the laws? And you find that in some cases, some countries just provide uh, penalties as a misdemeanor, which is like a lesser offense, uh, uh, punishable by maybe a maximum prison sentence of three years, or if it's a mandatory uh, 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 it's a fine, it's uh, the value that was adopted 50, 60 years ago, which with de uh, um, depreciation of uh, currencies over the years, this year, it means nothing. When you translate, uh, uh, for example, in some countries, it's, it's equivalent for defilement, uh, you pay an equivalent of, let's say, 30 US dollars, you know? So it, it doesn't make sense in this day uh, that we should still be having these laws that have a, ne a negative impact. On the face of it, they're okay, but the negative impact, because they mean nothing, because they will not stop people from, uh, from impunity, because they can pay their way off the justice system, even after defiling or, or sexually violating the rights of girls. And then the last thing that I would like to highlight is uh, the role of the courts. Uh, the courts, uh, our judicial officers, we live in systems uh, of uh, uh, plural legal systems. We have the formal system, legal system, we have the um, uh, customary uh, uh, justice system, but also the religious justice system. So these are the systems that, you know, Africa is built on. You know, our Africa is built on three different uh, kinds of justice systems, and these systems coexist. And in some cases, there are contradictory uh, 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 um, approaches to justice, especially when it comes to the issues of girls, which in the customary justice system, girls are looked at differently, and the former justice may look at them differently. And when cases become, come before the courts, you have uh, men who, uh, um, most of the judicial officers are men. I'm not saying men are bad, but, um, most judicial officers are men, and uh, it depends on what kind of orientation they have, uh, that uh, the way they decide cases to do with this. I'll give you two examples of uh, cases which, you know, kind of make you frown and wonder how on earth, you know, anyone can decide like this. We have cases, and these are real life cases. A girl, a 13 year old girl was defiled by a 20 something year old man. And uh, apparently they had a relationship, and this girl used to go to this uh, man's house 
several times and they would have, you know, sex on several occasions. And uh, uh, until someone, you know, saw them, the sister, the, the, the girl saw and then reported and then the issue, the man was arrested. And the initial court, you know, uh, um, uh, convicted him and uh, he appealed. But the judge, you know, uh, at the uh, higher court actually said that this girl was enjoying the relationship. She was actually asking for sexual favors from this man. And uh, she, the man believed that the girl was older. Uh, than, uh, can you can imagine, 13 year old, we're not talking about a, an 18 year old or 17 year old whom you can mistake in, is the mistake for an older person. But a 13 year old, they say he believed, because he said he believed that she was older. And the court listened and said, yeah, this girl, like almost like it was the girl's fault. And then they discharged this man and said, uh, you know, she, he, he could go because uh, also he was still young and he had a job. So the court was looking more at the interest of the man and not the interest of the girl, that this girl, young girl needs, needed to be protected. And examples like these are numerous in our court systems, uh, justice systems uh, uh, in Africa. So issues like those that um, uh, it depends on who is sitting on the bench and what kind of orientation do they have. So unless we educate, for example, our girls, and we have provide equal uh, space for our girls and boys uh, to uh, exercise their rights, equal protection for girls and boys. Uh, um, uh, in, the league, in the laws, beginning with the laws, and then moving on to practice. 30 years from now, or 20 years from now, we will still have the same kind of uh, um, uh, problems that we are talking about today. So those are the issues uh, um, that uh, we, some of the issues that this report has uh, uncovered. And also maybe one last thing, Dr. Seba, uh, that um, we have seen that the girl child is facing um, discrimination beginning from birth uh, to their teenage girls in various respects, right in the law, and then when they become adults as well. Because when you look, for example, at inheritance laws, you find that uh, in some countries, we still have laws that say that women cannot inherit, you know, uh, on their own. And other laws which say that uh, if uh, uh, a, 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 a parent dies and uh, their children, girls and boys, the girl inherits half of what the boy should inherit. And this is in the law, it's legal, sanctioned by the law. So those kinds of issues that we're still talking about, so women facing, um, uh, uh, girls facing uh, inequalities from birth to their uh, uh, teenage girls in various ways, and until they get married, there's no escape. But the law can do something. Good. Thank you very much, Violet. Could, could you share with us the two or three things you would like to see done? Yeah, so in terms of uh, what we'd like to see uh, uh, done, based on the, these uh, 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 challenges that we have highlighted and uh, which are very significant for the girl child in, uh, in Africa. First of all, it's uh, to make sure that our legal systems are gender sensitive. When developing laws, uh, if you look at most laws and uh, just do a web search to see if the girl is featured in the act, you will find that it's not. So we need our laws to be gender sensitive, to actually uh, be aware to the vulnerabilities, the specific vulnerabilities of the girl child and actually uh, um, um, uh, regulate and provide uh, for these vulnerabilities in law. And then the second thing is uh, to make sure that uh, the law, when it, uh, uh, I mean, for violations of rights of children and specifically for girls, there are stringent penalties because the penalties in some cases are not enough, are not adequate enough to actually deter perpetrators from committing their offenses. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is the ensuring that we have a judicial system that is accountable, uh, that is gender sensitive and accountable. And for them to be accountable to our girls, they need 
uh, to be uh, uh, made aware. We need to raise awareness, even in the judicial, uh, among judicial officers, about uh, the rights of girls and the specific vulnerabilities uh, that girls face, and why it is important that even the courts or the justice system should protect girls when all else has failed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, she has, she has, uh, has, if, if you read, if you read the report, she has, she has lots, lots of ideas about what kinds of reforms are needed in the legal area. Well, I would, I would like to invite you to give her, Violet, give her a good, good applause. Really, she has done a fantastic, she has done a fantastic job. Thank you very much, Violet.